Does anyone else do that? <laughs> Welcome back to the studio. Today I thought I would just do a little bit of watercolor painting in an art journaling kind of style. So I have my latest page in this sketchbook was when I was sick, a beverage, uh, my dog, the blankets. Um, and I thought that the colors of the things that I was using today and eating and drinking went nicely with this. So it would be a nice transition um, because the colors are analogous. There's a lot of yellows and oranges and a bit of red. And so I thought I would just have tea time. Grab yourself a tea or a cozy beverage and let's get painting. everybody I am uncapping my Twisby fountain pen this is my favorite fountain pen because of that giant ink barrel that you can see right there that is my ink it shows you how much I have left and it holds a lot way more than my Lamy safaris so it runs out way less often watch how I use ink to go around the top of this teapot it's not one continuous circle, it's broken. So that one almost made it all the way around. And then here you see I have a bit of a broken line and that's because with gesture, like how much, I guess the size of the tea pot drawing to my hand um, kind of tells you how much I'm going to be able to get a clean pen arc there. And I just knew that it I couldn't go all the way around that circle without it ending up wonky. So I kind of broke it into small little pieces which you might find helpful to do yourself. So in this pen I have loaded up some permanent black ink and that means I'll be able to watercolor over it in just a second and it will not bleed as long as I give it time to dry before I add that watercolor. So because this top of the cup is smaller I'm able to get all the way around the ellipse with uh, one little mark, one gesture with my hand but uh, if it's any larger, I'm going to have to break it up into a couple little marks. And it's okay to draw a couple lines. Um, it doesn't, it makes it, I guess, a little scratchier in style, but you can see me kind of doubling up on some of the lines I make just to try to capture one overall shape a little better. Um, it doesn't always work. Sometimes that second line uh, ends up making it look a little wonkier, but that's fine. My least uh, favorite part of this sketch, as it turned out, was uh, the bowl. Um, this, the round bowl. This little dish here is a strange shape. I quite enjoy it. I don't believe it really turned out perspective-wise when I drew it, but I'm really, I mean, when I'm sketch journaling or art journaling, I let go of that expectation for things to be perfect, and I acknowledge that you know, I know it doesn't look right, but I can't fix it now that it's an in ink. And I have to have enough confidence that I don't worry about what other people might think about my sketch. Like, oh, she teaches drawing. How did she not see how poorly this, you know, perspective is on this shape? Well, I do, but it's not always worth redoing the whole sketch or stressing about or trying to manipulate and fix. Sometimes we just enjoy the process and we move on. So... Um, there's my disclaimer about how I work in in these books is sometimes, I mean, I, I know I'm making a mess sometimes. I know I'm um, making a mistake with some perspective or something doesn't turn out as good as I expected. And it's just part of the process. I actually think it helps you uh, let go. It's something that we need to practice in our life in general, not just in drawing. Um, but it's one of those other lessons that drawing can teach you that can apply to your personal life as well. I suffer perfectionism. I think a, uh, from perfectionism, I think a lot of artists do because we want to create the world we see. We want to create what's in our head sometimes. 
And it gets like, quite aggravating when we're not capable. And so part of that edge of being a perfectionist helps us get better, but it can hold us back as well. So the bottom of this bowl is just, ouch, awkward. And you'll see me kind of try to puzzle through it a little and then just give up laying more ink down because it's kind of just drawing more attention to this uh, poor aspect of the drawing. So I just move on from there. So I'm grabbing a size four round brush and I'm getting some yellow on it. And I think that I really probably should have sized up instead of using a four. I mean, the four allows me to get quite a lot of detail, but you can see it's not holding a lot of water. And so I have to keep, um, you know, getting more paint on it. And it just sort of breaks up the painting process a little bit. Um, so I think that brush size really does matter and you have to pick the right one for the job. So if you're doing a lot of what I'm doing right here, back and forth, back and forth, I don't think you're really utilizing the, uh, the power of watercolor. Um, you need to, to size up to another brush. Um, but that said, when I start going in here and getting some shadow in, um, the, the size four works really well for me. So maybe I should have just used more than one size. So I recommend this for you as well. Um, take in consideration how much area you're covering. I laid in a general, um, cadmium lemon hue and I had mixed in a bit of what looks like a Naples. And then this here is a shadow, shadow violet. Uh, it's kind of a unique color, but. It's from da Daniel Steele? No, Daniel Smith. <laughs> Daniel Smith. And I, I love this shade, Shadow Violet. It's very soft, so it laid on this yellow just gorgeously. I say Steele because I know many of you know this by now, but one of my biggest influences for watercolor is Liz Steele. Um, I find her incredibly inspirational. I first discovered her because I was looking at a book published or by or basically starring Daniel Gregory, who's a wonderful visual artist and all about drawing your daily life. And he did a ton of food drawings and illustrations. And so I, I got some books from him and kind of jumped from there to watching all sorts of urban sketchers. And Liz Steele was featured in one of these books. So then I jumped on and started following her on YouTube a little and then um, basically enrolling in some of her watercolor courses or sketching. It's basically sketching. It's not just watercolor um, because she was an architect, trained as an architect. And so I have a lot to learn from her um, amazing skill at, I guess what I loved and was attracted to the most with her is her skill at being loose and still achieving something she wants. So it's that delicate, delicate balance between control and then letting paint be paint. And one thing I love is that, yes, she does a lot of buildings, a lot of architecture, but I love how often she paints her tea. She's a fellow tea obsessed individual like myself and paints her tea or coffee almost every day. So she's got hundreds of sketchbooks. If you haven't checked her out, please go right this instant, look at some of her stuff and you'll have a better idea of, you know, my, my main influence in watercolor sketching. I'm obsessed. I'm not done her course. Um, the one that I did start was called watercolor on location. And it was all about painting basically urban sketching out on location. And I'm a plein air painter, or at least have some training in plein air painting. And so this was really cool to, to move away from oil painting and, and making a finished product on a canvas or board of a landscape, and then switching to doing watercolor and sketchbooks. Now I did start well before that influence. I did start watercolor and sketchbooks because when I was in France for a year, my mom mailed me a little tiny Windsor and Newton watercolor travel set. And it was the most inspiring present ever. I was in Paris for Christmas and got this little set. It was one of the few gifts I got that year because I was so far from home and it changed everything. 
I was an artist long before that. It's not like that's the turn of where I became an artist, but it is what made me fall for watercolor, which I always saw as a sort of traditional medium, right? Like you have to control it so much. There's layering, there's rules. Um, but as in everything I'm learning there, you can break those rules and you can use it your own way. And there may be people who scoff at you, but that really doesn't matter if you find something you love. So use it to my own devices. So I'm doing a lot where, uh, in this painting anyway, where I'm coloring in, it feels like a coloring book really, color in the red, and then I go and I find a shadow color. This one has some blue in it, so there's some purple um, shadow or, or tone developing there, but I'm dropping it into the wet paint. So you're going to get natural blooming and bleeding of one color into another, and I'm doing that almost everywhere here. Uh, I had a bit more control on the teapot. It was a bit drier when I added the gray, but with the teacup, you can see it was wet on wet technique, and so it just does its own magical thing. I've got a pyrrolene red oxide, I believe, is the one between the crimson looking color and the cadmium yellow, the one I'm just touching right now, and it's like a burnt orange, and it is so strong. That pigment is, it just knocks everything out. You need a tiny little bit, and it is so incredibly vibrant and strong. It looks red in the pan, and then as soon as you get it on paper, it's like a bright orange. So I mixed a little bit of sap green with a tiny bit of phthalo green, like a phthalo, closest thing I can liken that to is turquoise, and um, I'm trying to make this sort of mint colored bowl. Not very inspired with the bowl. I kind of just wanted to move on. <laughs> Has a little bit of a burgundy lip to the top of the bowl. This set of watercolor is one that I made up. Um, I got the tin, you know, just a $20 watercolor set on Amazon. And then I took out the pans in that tin and made my own. I ordered pans, the little plastic half pans on Amazon and little magnets that I cut up and super glued to the bottom. And they're just sort of, a lot of them are clipped in and then there's magneted, one's magneted into the center and in in, down the center there. There's room for maybe one more pan, half pan, but I don't really need any more colors right now. This is already quite heavy to carry around with me in my purse because it does have a lot of colors in it, but I can't seem to bring myself to take any out. <laughs> so it's getting kind of old though. Uh, the lids, the sides that flip out are on their near to last legs. So I might have to get a new pan and start fresh soon, but for now, it has gone so many places with me. And if you haven't already seen it, I did a little um, YouTube video on what travel supplies I use, in, and in particular, the bags and how, uh, the bags I use and what I put in them. And my little watercolor dish there, even though it's full of watercolor, it still fits into my smaller art bag, which is a fanny pack. So a hip pack. So if you haven't already seen that video and you're interested in what I take out of the house, how I size down my supplies, what I think is the most important when I'm going to sketch in a brewery, a coffee shop, um, outside on a hike, then you can go check that out. My supplies don't vary all that much from what I use at home to what I use when I'm out and about, but I think you could still find something interesting in there, especially about kind of how I organize it all into the bags to protect the books that I'm using from the water, etc., etc. So you see how I'm dropping in this burnt umber and ultramarine and into the soft shadow violet and it letting it bleed out on its own. 
I decide in just a second that instead of leaving it as its own little drawing next to a different one that I'm going to tie things together and make it more like a journal. So I'm using this Le Pen in Periwinkle, I think it's called, and it's so pale. It's such a pale purple, purple like lavender. And um, I'm drawing little faint lines. This same marker pen, whatever you want to call it, felt tip, I've used throughout this sketchbook. So it creates kind of a coherent look with this this purple line. Often in other places in this book, I actually wrote in that purple pen. But now I'm starting to use the pen as just a line and then going and writing with my Twisby in black ink, which I, it's, I balk a little bit at doing that just because it could take away from the drawings, I think. But once again, like they're not finished works of art. They're memories for me. They're ways to practice um, keeping my hand in drawing and paint. And, um, and so I'm just going to keep practicing as I go forward, um, tying things in a little bit more, not just thinking of every single sketch as its own individual blip but rather that these are part of a continuous whole, a story. I do fill out the books chronologically, like from left to right, so you can go through and see the progression of my year or my month, um, rather than opening up at random and working. I just like the effect of being able to kind of go through and see what happened first on a trip and, and whatnot. So it kind of reads like a story almost, like I'm illustrating my life. I think that is a title of one of the books I read about um, that I was mentioning earlier about Daniel Gregory it was um, Illustrate Your Life. That might have been what it was called. I don't mind linking to a few of those books below if that's something that interests you. So here I am making a blue border and I think it ties in that little bit of blue showing up on the bedspread on the blanket on the left side of the page and then that sort of purple gray shadow I put on the left side of the page not shadow but a box behind that drawing um, that kind of relates to the purple shadow on the right. So I think that there's several uh, several tie-ins between these two pages now. And I'm not trying to make it perfect. I'm just trying to keep it generally square and um, letting it be a little, a little wonky, beautiful mess. So I'm just going to fast forward here as I do this border and then I kind of enhance it, go back over it a little bit, adding some blue in throughout. And that's a cobalt blue. the brighter of my two blues. And here is the final result before any words have been added. And then I'm kind of comparing with what I had on the previous page to think about tying it in. I was kind of looking at what my printing slash handwriting looked like on the previous page so I could keep going. Um, I can write in a lot of different uh, styles and so I want it to kind of be um, a bit similar, be a bit coherent, cohesive. So I just wrote having a cozy tea break with mango, orange slices, and a cafe soundtrack. It is a creative day. Not a very creative thing to write, but then I went back into a previous sketch and wrote sick day. What's around me? Dot, dot, dot. And next I go back with that same pen. And if the watercolor is still damp, it's going to really bleed and make a thick mark, um, way thicker than it normally uh, comes out. So I think that what's happening here, you can see that dark line forming. That's because the paper's still damp. Um, so beware that if you do this drawing like watercolor and ink in reverse and you do the ink after the watercolor, um, sometimes it creates a really thick line. Even when the paper dries, sometimes the line is um, thicker. So you have to kind of be prepared for that. 
I really enjoyed adding a little bit of a thicker line um, here. It's one of the things we work on a lot in my drawing one class is line quality. So vary your line quality, make it thick line, thin line, lightweight, heavyweight, and that brings some variety to your composition. It brings some drama. You can use line to show shadow or to show weight. Don't forget to add the date. I made a rhyme. Next, I just flipped back a page to where I had some uh, lines but nothing written yet and added in some notes about that day's sketch. That sketch, um, I did the vase of flowers, candle and teapot and the little gift bag there. And then I didn't um, have time or I didn't complete any more of a sketch at my friend's house when we were sketching together. But I left that space and later just Googled like a pottery cup and painted that in because I remember we were using uh, glazed pottery at her house and I didn't have a picture of it or anything. But this is just to say that you can paint when you're there in person and then you can always do a tiny bit of research for um, resources and then add to it later. Do some journaling after the fact, not actually in the moment. That's perfectly fine. So here I add uh, some pen to this because it was just really a blurry drawing. Um, I had done everything wet on wet to kind of get that glazed effect that you see in pottery sometimes um, in ceramics. And you can see that that line is a lot, uh, it's pretty bold because it's happening after the watercolor. But I just kept it pretty simple and had to think about how much line I did want to add. I don't love the drawing of the cup, but I don't care. It's the composition of that page needed it for sure. Et voila, on est fini. So here's the spread that I did that led into my sick day and today's little tea painting. And here's the overall feel of this sketchbook. Um, some travel sketching, some just practicing, studying, stuff like that. I hope you enjoyed sitting down and making a cozy little tea painting with me.